Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us. My name is Jenny Baumgartner. It's my pleasure to welcome you all to the ODP Prevention SIG webinar series. So the Prevention SIG webinar series is designed to provide a space for the public to hear from prevention research experts and thought leaders who are making advances in public health. I will be your moderator for this session. So today we're thrilled to have Dr. Lee Charvet from New York University Langone Health present does transcranial direct current stimulation have a role in the management of multiple sclerosis symptoms. I will be delivering a short uh, introduction, a formal introduction for Dr. Charvet shortly. All right, but um, before we get started, um, before we start the presentation, I would like to go over some of the logistics for today's session. So all lines should have been muted upon entry and should stay muted throughout this presentation. There will be a question and answer session at the end of the presentation. So please submit any questions you have to the Q&A pod directed to all panelists. You may use the chat pod for general commentary or to request technical assistance. ODP staff will monitor these during the session. So while our guest is speaking, you'll be able to focus on them by going to the top left of your page pulling down the view menu and clicking hide non-video participants. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and posted to the ODP website and YouTube channel. So I know everyone's very excited for the presentation. Um, so I'll now turn to introduce our speaker. All right, Dr. Lee Charvet is the Director of Multiple Sclerosis Research and Professor of Neurology at NYU Langone Health. She's a clinical neuropsychologist with an extensive background in characterizing and treating symptoms of multiple sclerosis that affect quality of life. Her focus is in the application of merging technologies, her symptomatic management and rehabilitation with those living with MS at the forefront. A goal of her work is to enable home-based access to therapies as telehealth. She's established a large research program studying the use of non-invasive brain stimulation with transcranial direct current stimulation, or TDCS for short. She leads ongoing tri uh, trials, delivering um, treatments at home using telerehabilitation platforms to treat multiple sclerosis symptoms, including fatigue, cognitive, and motor functioning. She's also completing a mechanistic study in MS using simultaneous TDCS with neuroimaging to characterize the underlying mechanisms of therapeutic change. So prior to coming to NYU, Dr. Charvet was in the Department of Neurology at Stony Brook Medicine and previously worked for the CNS Division of Scientific Affairs for Johnson & Johnson. She completed her doctorate in Vanderbilt University and fellowship at Stony Brook Medicine. And again, we're very excited to have her join us. And with that, I will pass it over to you, Dr. Charvet. Well, thank you for the wonderful introduction and thank you so much for having me. It's really an honor to get to speak with you all. Um, so as you heard, I'm gonna speak about uh, a type of non-invasive brain stimulation called transcranial direct current stimulation. And in our investigation story on whether it has a role in the management of, of the symptoms of MS. So first, my disclosures, um, and also want to note that uh, the use of TDCS in the United States is still considered investigational use. So everything I speak about is is, is considered investigational. And the way I structure this is is, is yeah, I'm going to speak about really complicated topics, but just kind of a broad overview um, to tell the, our story about our research. And so first, just about why TDCS and what brought us here, um, and an overview of TDCS in general and, and the current state of the clinical literature, and then about our approach uh, with participation from home for our trials, which we call remotely supervised or RSTDCS, and then what we found so far using uh, RSTDCS uh, for symptom management and MS. So first to talk about um, just the tremendous unmet need of the symptom burden or disease burden for people living with MS. And so again, as a very broad overview or introduction, um, MS is a chronic progressive and common uh, disease of the central nervous system. And it affects over 1 million people in the US alone, more women than men, 
and it's a lifespan disease. And so the typical age of onset is in younger adulthood. So people are living with MS then their whole lives. Um, you can even have a pediatric onset and it's progressive and it's without cure. So it, and it doesn't significantly alter life expectancy. So again, it's that accumulation of disability that really alters quality of life in MS. And just broadly, MS has uh, subtypes, which are just defined by the type of course of progression. Uh, most people start out with what's called a relapsing remitting course, where they have acute episodes of neuroinflammation and dysfunction, followed by relative recovery, but again, with accumulation of disability over time. Most people transition then to what's called secondary progressive or progressive course, where you have gradual uh, decline and progression uh, without the acute episodes. And some people start that way with a primary progressive course. But as you see across the board, um, progression and accumulation of disability is a major feature of the disease. Um, so because of the nature of MS and how it affects people, there's really a wide, wide range of symptoms. It's diverse and, and, and varying across individuals. Um, broadly, we can think about it in terms of cognitive dysfunction, motor dysfunction, and then what we sometimes call the invisible symptoms. So sensory disturbances, things like fatigue, depression, pain, all of these uh, uh, have a tremendous symptom burden and reduce disability and quality of life over time. And this is what we need for reliable and effective options for symptomatic management. MS is treated with disease modifying therapies, which slow disease activity and progression, but they're not designed and are not effective in targeting these specific symptoms. So, as you heard, I'm a clinical neuropsychologist, so I've worked with people living with MS many, many years, and I came to the world of TDCS, as you'll hear, just because of new technologies and new treatments and, and new options um, always need to be evaluated and explored to see if we can use them to help people living with MS have greater quality of life. And so, just as a broad introduction, as I mentioned, TDCS is one type of non-invasive brain stimulation, and this is a broad... Um, umbrella of different uh, approaches, techniques, and devices uh, to, for, for brain stimulation. We can generally divide it into transcranial magnetic stimulation, which a lot of people are familiar with, and it is clinically indicated for use in the United States, TMS, and related technologies. And then TDCS is under the category of transcranial electrical stimulation. And again, just to note that there's many different techniques and, and emerging technologies in this world. It's really a fast-paced world. But TDCS is actually the single most studied of all the techniques for non-invasive brain stimulation. And broadly, what TDCS does is pass weak currents of electricity through the brain um, using scalp electrodes. And the electrodes are placed to target the region of interest or the therapeutic target. And the goal here is neuromodulation. Um, so, because of, of the broad potential use, the current itself is thought to be effective, for instance, in treatment of depression, but also TDCS is often used in rehabilitation um, to pair with the training activity to boost the learning that can occur. Um, uh, there's mechanisms of plasticity that in, improve um, with the simultaneous uh, stimulation and training. And TDCS is really interesting because I mentioned that it is not approved for indication in the United States, and we're an outlier in that way. It's approved in many other countries uh, for use, but it is commercially available. So it has an interesting de device history um, where, where consumers are able to get their own TDCS devices. And this has contributed to really my experience in, in the eight years or so working in the field of TDCS. It's often put on the technology hype cycle. Um, so, so, especially a few years ago, we saw this peak of inflated expectations because of all the potential uses for TDCS, including boosting human performance, uh, for instance, boosting cognitive functioning or boosting learning or boosting sports, uh, so sports enhancement, followed by a trough of disillusionment where maybe there isn't the studies, you know, panning out or showing us as much of the uh, benefit as we expected. And I believe now we're in the slope of enlightenment where, where carefully controlled trials will help us um, really guide its use, especially clinical use for our patients. And what we need to do with uh, to have guided use is, is the level of the evidence. So we really need uh, controlled randomized trials, large trials to help us get reach that level A evidence that you can see here with the PRISMA guidelines to know that it's definitely effective. 
We also need the trials to know that it's definitely not effective. So we just really need that level of evidence um, to help guide us and, and move towards clinical use. Uh, I want to point you to this wonderful recent review of the evidence based guidelines based on a, a, all the uses of TDCS in clinical trials for neurologic and psychiatric disorders. And one of the major conclusions is, is exactly that, that we just need these large controlled trials to really guide future direction. Um, the only condition that we know that is definitely effective or TDCS is definitely effective for is major depressive disorder, which would make sense if you think about uh, the history of non use of non-invasive brain stimulation therapies in general, including TMS for treatment of depression. And depression is also very relevant, of course, to people living with MS. Um, and there's not an MS-specific depression treatment. So again, it's an appealing non-drug option. But there's many conditions that are probably effective that uh, are very relevant for people living with MS and many, many that are also possibly effective. So we have hundreds and hundreds of clinical trials in TDCS. So there, and there's just been an exponential growth. So many, many clinical trials, but clinical conclusions remain very limited. Um, and the reason for this is really logistical. Um, so there's been small sample sizes in most of the trials. Most of them are proof of principle. And also it's traditionally been underdosed in terms of too few sessions uh, administered to really adequately evaluate its behavioral effect or clinical benefit. So when we think about dosing, it really needs to be well-defined and understood for TDCS. And dosing parameters are multidimensional. So we can think about current intensity and current polarity, the duration of the stimulation or stimulation session, how long is it, um, where we're targeting the stimulation. Also the paired brain state, especially is important when we're thinking about like a synergistic benefit, for instance, for rehabilitation um, to boost training. Um, and then also that number, oops, I'm sorry, I went too far. And also the number and frequency of stimulation sessions. So we know for sure that TDCS is cumulative. So the extended repeated application is needed for the adequate evaluation of behavioral effect. And so again, we know that multiple doses are needed, but and we don't know how many are needed, but, but definitely more than have been studied in clinical trials to date. And just to give you a quick example, when you go to the literature to try to get clinical guidance, and 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 this is from alcohol use disorder, just um, you know, and you could tell the same story almost in any condition that's been studied. So we have a large number of trials, well, well thought out trials, but resulting in limited conclusions. And this is because of, of, of exactly the factors that I mentioned. Some of the trials are limited by small sample size. If you look at the number of sessions, uh, many trials are even just still one, one application of TDCS. Um, I would argue that all of the trials here have been underdosed to try to evaluate its effect. There's also dosing regimen in terms of timing. Is it daily, every day, three times a week? Stimulation parameters are broadly agreed upon and, and same with the target. But again, even a little bit of variation may make a difference in terms of the clinical outcomes. And then tasks are very variable, whether there are is a paired task at the time or not, to eat, both to keep the brain state consistent, but also for that synergistic effect. And so that results in a checkerboard of, of, of uh, positive and negative findings, green or red. And so it's really hard, especially if we think about our focus of clinical use to move forward, despite the volume of clinical trials. So now I wanna speak about our approach to that. And so we came from a background in telerehabilitation um, before, before we came to the world of TDCS. And so we knew already that we must go home and have, have this accessible from home in order to do a study that has adequate sample size and adequate dosing in terms of daily dosing. Uh, there's just tremendous advantages for these designs, including faster recruitment of larger sample sizes and the extended number of sessions uh, for adequate dosing and evaluation. Also to, to mention um, being able to have participants access our treatments from home is very relevant. For instance, if we've just lived through the, the research pause related to COVID, um, and so we were able to continue our trials, but also there's a really interesting and emerging literature on the potential clinical benefit or use or role of TDCS and, and related technologies um, to manage acute and chronic 
COVID-19 illness. And so having something deployable in real time would be a tremendous benefit uh, for, for these patients to evaluate and see if it has a therapeutic role. When we first started to think about going at home, um, we met with a lot of experts in the area and came up with consensus guidelines on what really are the key elements for at-home TDCS trials. And so this is an opposition to giving somebody a device and, 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 and not having that close contact with them or, or precise dose control, but instead this is really a rigorous protocol that where we're, our goal here is to replicate the on-site clinical trial standards, but in the home setting. Um, so there's key elements in that we of course wanna monitor for safety and tolerability. We want very precise dosing, uh, reliable electro placement, and the goal here is too is re reproducible results, right? So we wanna make sure everything is very consistent and rigorous in our trials. So we called our, so taking these um, recommendations into account, we came up with what we call remotely supervised or RSTDCS, which is a protocol to do at home TDCS trials. The key element for our protocol is live supervision at every session. So we're live with our participants through video conference at every single treatment. We have a standardized protocol with extensive criteria, go, no go criteria to ensure safety and tolerability and also uniformity for the treatment. Um, we also have very much worked with our patient participants in collaboration to optimize the equipment involved because our goal also is to have very minimal technical burden for our participants at home. Um, so, okay. so the key components here is first the TDCS device. We use Soterix's many CTs, um, which is operated by a single use unlock code. And so these are pre-programmed devices, so totally suitable for sham or active um, programming for a blinded trial, so a controlled trial. And it allows for visual confirmation and clearance before the participant is given a single unused, single unlock code for the use for the delivery of that day's session. So very precise dose control. The um, headset is an elasticized headband with uniform positioning, visual guidance to make sure everything's in place. And another true innovation uh, that that we've appreciated very much is, is the use of we call them, you know, snap electrodes. So these are single-use, pre-moistened, pre-saline saturated sponges with electrode inside that the participant can can just snap onto their headset. And the advantage here is that many people that we work with, for instance, have motor impairment or limited use of their hands. And so we, we need to make this process as easy as possible for them. So a single session is based on live supervision. We provide our participants with computers where we can connect with them. Um, the only thing that has to be done is for the computer to be connected to the internet and we can take over and do everything else, including initiating the video conference. Um, so we can guide them to the headset placement, then we give them the visual clearance, and every session is run by that go, no go criteria to ensure that everything is uniform, safe, and tolerable. We did a lot of work, um, again, in true collaboration with our, our participants living with MS to optimize the equipment and to develop the whole process and protocol. And we've learned too, we've, we've been able to show that this is really a protocol that's generalizable across almost any, for use in almost any condition, or almost anyone can do this. Um, and I think that's, that really speaks to the true diversity of people living with MS. Uh, we, we reach people of all different ages. It's a true lifespan disorder. Uh, all different ranges of disability levels from minimal to really severe disabilities, um, and the tremendous variability in symptom presentation as well, informing use for cognitive or motor recovery as well as for psychological symptoms. Um, I used to have to make this uh, case quite a bit more before the COVID pandemic, but uh, there's just a tremendous need for at-home access that we, so, so we surveyed our participants um, and, and we did this because we're located in Midtown Manhattan. So, of course, quite a bit of urban density where everybody's very close technically to clinic. Um, but still, it's a tremendous burden for somebody, even in this setting, in an urban setting, to come in every day for a treatment. And again, our treatments are, you know, 20, 30 sessions or more. And so we surveyed our, our patient participants who helped us develop the protocol. And there are, for those with homes within the New York City metro region, 
an average an hour and a half to get to clinic are over 15 and over $15 and those in the suburbs are spending three and a half hours in travel time and $45 per visit. And that doesn't even count the time that they are here. So you just you can imagine the tremendous cost that, that, that our patients are expending to actually participate in our trials uh, if they're required to be on site. And we definitely have found that this allows us to meet reach many more people living with MS and it really more truly representative uh, samples in our studies. So now I'm going to switch and uh, tell you about some of our findings in our research program using this protocol, the RSTDCS protocol. And so first, um, we want to be sure everything is safe and tolerable and feasible. And so once we've established the protocol, we did, we just recently did a, an analysis from six sham controlled trials and open label active trials that we've done here at our center and 308 participants, the majority living with MS um, and the rest have Parkinson's disease and a range of other neurologic conditions. Um, again, showing that it's generalizable across conditions and we were able to analyze 6,779 sessions. And so again, finding very safe and tolerable, which is really consistent with the broad TDCS literature in general that it, of safety and tolerability. Only one participant of all the participants in our trials was not able to pass. We had the tolerability test in the beginning. And so, so um, again, overwhelmingly tolerable for our patient participants. And only three sessions of all of those sessions have been stopped or aborted due to patient pain or discomfort. And even then it wasn't uh, overall treatment limiting. And with the feasibility, again, we're reaching that broad age range and people of all different disability levels. So as a neuropsychologist, my, I came to this world again, focused on cognitive functioning. Um, this is a really troublesome symptom for many people living with MS. It's very common. It's typically called mild, uh, led by slowed information processing speed, but even you can imagine slowed information processing speed can be quite disabling across the workday or getting everything done you need to do in a day. Um, and over time it can progress, the cognitive processing speed underlies a lot of other cognitive functions. And so it, it can progress and include things like rate of learning and other cognitive operations. So I mentioned that we had already been in the telerehabilitation space and many years ago now we did a trial of adaptive cognitive training uh, using Positive Sciences Brain HQ. Uh, and we did it as a home based trial. We'll, we'll use remote supervision here as well. Uh, we recruited 135 people living with MS. And the recruitment alone, we recruited in 20 months, which was just remarkable to us. And that really uh, convinced us right away that we must be able to have home access for our treatments. Just there's just tremendous demand. For, for the accessibility of, of being able to access a treatment, to have a treatment at home. Um, and they trained for 60 hours over 12 weeks and we had an active gaming control. Uh, we had high rates of completion and we found that that adaptive cognitive training led to significantly greater benefit than the cognitive control. And so this was around the time that I was introduced to the world of non-invasive brain stimulation and TDCS. And so the idea here is if we can boost Rehabilitation is there a potential synergistic effect of TDCS and training and the idea is that we're boosting brain plasticity. So, the learning mechanisms with functional targeting. So, at the same time, the brain is engaged in training. We're stimulating that region to see if we can boost the outcome. So, we did a basically a proof of principle trial is our 1st, RS TDCS trial where, where we added the stimulation to the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. Um, at the same time as, as our, our participants were playing the cognitive games or cognitive training. And this was all underdosed for clinical outcomes. Uh, it was just 10 sessions, so underdosed both for the cognitive training and for the TDCS. But in this proof of principle, we did find a significant and selective benefit um, for, for aspects of co complex attention and inter individual variability that were really consistent with that functional targeting goal. Um, so a selective benefit for, for participants who receive the stimulation. During the course of our development work in that trial in particular, we had many, many people telling us that their fatigue was improving with treatment. 
So fatigue and MS is, so is defined by an overwhelming sense of tiredness and lack of energy and feelings of exhaustion. And it's, it's really a troublesome symptom for many, many people. Um, in fact, you know, a subset of people report that as their worst symptom living with MS. And it is one of our most major unmet treatment needs. There's been dozens of clinical trials of drugs, um, all of which are essentially negative, negative meaning that often both the active and placebo conditions uh, show improvement, but we don't have any reliably effective uh, treatment options at this time for, for fatigue and MS. And so there's an interesting story. So we were targeting with cognitive training and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex with the TDCS. And while we don't know exactly the, the um, pathophysiology of MS fatigue, so that's also remained a, a frustration in the research world, but there's strong evidence for a fatigue network of which the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex may be a target. So that confirmed that maybe that would be uh, an insight into the mechanism of why our patients were also feeling some benefit from fatigue. And that corresponded with some work across both in MS and in other conditions that fatigue is, is, is benefiting from TDCS treatment across pilot trials. So we did a controlled pilot study uh, looking at uh, that treatment, the cognitive training with the TDCS and for 20 sessions. And we did find that there was a significant benefit with the active versus sham TDCS for a drop in fatigue, so improvement, a significant improvement in fatigue. And you'll also see it was a nice linear drop over time, really confirming that cumulative effect that we need many sessions to find the benefit. So based on those findings, we just completed a trial of TDCS for the management of MS-related fatigue uh, funded by the National MS Society. And here the design was we went out to 30 sessions. So it's the same cognitive training with, with TDCS, active or sham, and for 30 sessions. The primary outcome was fatigue, and we also measured the benefit on cognitive functioning. And just consistent with our story that, that uh, of the home accessibility for enrollment in our trials, we were able to enroll 120 uh, participants in 22 months, and uh, also strong compliance with, with uh, completing the full protocol. So preliminary results um, look more like the drug trials now, in that both the active and sham condition showed significant improvement from baseline, and the active and sham did not differentiate between conditions. So, so that was different than we certainly hypothesized based on our pilot. And um, so, again, this is very preliminary, and we're, we're actively analyzing the full trial now. Um, but one idea is that in this trial, we very carefully screened out for depression. Um, so both depression and fatigue are, are defined by self-report and there's significant overlap. Um, so one idea is that we may have screened out for the component of fatigue that, that is benefiting from TDCS or that depression mediates the fatigue benefit to some degree. We also don't know the role of cognitive training. So again, we just stuck with the cognitive training plus the stimulation, but cognitive training may have its own benefit. And so we need to more to explore that, for instance, in a, a, another controlled trial. Um, also, our sham was a little bit different in that it was actually more of a low dose TDCS versus a true sham, um, which may have been the reason why we found benefit in both arms. But our findings, again, are consistent with, with, with what the trials of medications have shown today is that both the active and placebo arms are showing benefit from, from, from treatment. Um, but unlike the medications, we don't have uh, concerns as much with the tolerability profile. So more to come with that. But when we turn to the cognitive findings, the secondary outcome, we did confirm our pilot findings and that we found a significant benefit for active versus the sham TDCS. And this was measured by the BICAMS, which is the Brief International Cognitive Assessment in, in MS, uh, with uh, the symbol digit modalities test for information processing speed, and then a measure of verbal learning and a measure of visual learning. And so if we look at the composite there, only the active group significantly improved from baseline. And again, there was a significant benefit for active versus sham TDCS in the cognitive arm. So here we've confirmed our pilot findings. And 
Um, it's also interesting, and we did not select or recruit for cognitive impairment, but again, it's a very common, at least um, cognitive involvement is very common for many people living with MS. Um, and also confirms to us that that processing speed that we're targeting does underlie those cognitive functions. Um, so here, if you compare, we did 30 days of 20 sessions uh, of the, the treatment versus our original trial that I showed you, which was that intensive 60 days, you know, across 12 weeks. And so the idea here really confirms our hope in that TDCS may be able to potentiate the benefits of cognitive training and other other rehabilitations. We're following this up in parallel, um, and I don't have results to show you, but we're also doing a mechanistic study led by my colleague here, Dr. G, um, where we're doing a simultaneous TDCS MRI scan before and after that treatment. So here, our participants are doing 20 sessions uh, at home of, of, of the stimulation with the cognitive training, and we're looking both at fatigue and cognitive outcomes, and we're repeating the scan at the end. And the idea here is that if we can first get insight into the mechanism of benefit and also to see if we can identify markers to, to identify who will selectively have the um, benefit and understand better um, how to use TDCS uh, for optimal benefit for, for patients. And we have recruited 31 participants with MS and 32 healthy controls in this study. And again, analyses here are pending. So that was the cognitive story that, that led us um, into the world of TDCS. And um, there's a parallel study and a very strong study in the literature uh, across conditions for uh, functional targeting for motor recovery with TDCS. So if we look at MS, there's multiple factors contributing to both lower and upper extremity motor dysfunction. It's really common to have that involvement. And so there's approaches where um, TDCS can boost the known benefits of aerobic physical activity, for instance, in functional mobility with walking as an outcome, and increase the plasticity underlying the learning that occurs in rehabilitative training. So our first pilot here was led by my colleague, Dr. Poloni, um, and this was pairing stimulation with aerobic exercise. So now we're targeting the motor cortex, and this was 10 sessions of TDCS with either active or sham, um, active or sham TDCS with aerobic exercise. And the, so um, this study found a significant benefit for active versus sham TDCS and measures of walking speed and stride length. It also had a uh, clinical benefit that, that the participants detected the benefit as well, and it was persisting at the one month follow up. I wanted to point out here too that the day four is circled because um, many trials uh, are still looking at the effect of one TDCS session. But here, if we had looked at a fewer sessions, we could have completely missed this finding, and it just really is consistent with that cumulative benefit of TDCS. So our hope and our plan we're piloting right now is to move this to the home setting that was done on site. Um, we have are piloting now the, the um, procedures that we hope to do the large trial to follow up those findings. Um, we can do at home exercise in the context of the RS TDCS protocol with a seated elliptical trainer. Um, and also, uh, Dr. Poloni has de developed a remote gait assessment as well. So this can easily be moved into the home setting for that uh, larger scale trial. If we look at upper extremity motor functioning, we just completed a pilot study here um, in people with progressive MS. So these are people who have more advanced uh, disease and more advanced forms of motor disability. We recruited 66 patient participants with progressive MS in, in the context of 30 months. Again, during, during COVID, we were still able to because of the home-based trial. And um, so they had impaired use of one or both hands. And uh, this was a, a protocol for 20 sessions, and it was paired with uh, a set um, a hand manual dexterity training program. And just to note also with the enrollment, again, just as we saw in, in the large fatigue trial, we have really high rates of compliance for this extended treatment um, period. So this is what the setup looks like. And this is the very simple exercises that have been validated for home-based use, and they're guided by our TDCS technicians um, th through the video conference. So they have the stimulation and, and the hand exercises. 
the primary outcome here was a device development um, pilot, and this was an instrumented grip device, and, and it was looking at change in grip force over time. And there was no differentiation on the grip device in terms of active or sham conditions. However, if we look at the clinical outcomes on manual dexterity, we did find um, that the active group had significantly greater gains in manual dexterity um, and, and the use of their hands uh, on our measures than the sham condition. And that also is consistent if we look at change by affected hand. Um, so one or both hands can be affected. And if we look at it by affected hand, we found a significant benefit as well. Again, preliminary, but very encouraging results uh, in the, the functional targeting. So again, our goal here is, is really to move towards um, the evidence that we need to guide clinical use for uh, people living with MS. Um, and so uh, TDCS at home is both possible and necessary to reach our participants for these trials. Our RSTDCS protocol is really extensively developed and validated. To, to have those lab standards for the rigor of a clinical trial uh, and recruit a, a wide range of participants that are representative. And um, we can recruit uh, at a fast rate, I think we've demonstrated, and uh, really understand the dosing as well, especially in terms of cumulative dosing. So in summary, all of this is, is leading with what I, I hope and I think the field may, may come to is telehealth TDCS and MS. Uh, I think that our goal is to have this a, as an informed option for care and that it can be home-based care. Um, this, again, the tremendous unmet need for many people living with MS to have something that they can both have access to and to know it can be helpful in improving their quality of life and their functioning. So TDCS and other non-invasive non brain stimulation therapies offer a great deal of promise um, for many uh, symptoms of, of MS and uh, recovery of motor and cognitive functioning. And it's, it's again, both possible and necessary, I believe, to have home-based treatment. And I do believe that this is where TDCS in particular will be used clinically. Um, and at, with the, at least the very preliminary findings that I've shared with you, we do believe that TDCS can boost cognitive and motor recovery. We definitely, of course, need more research, including dosing optimization. Um, uh, and uh, importantly, also, once you have a benefit, there's really an open question of what you need to do to maintain that benefit. But again, we're encouraged by our findings and uh, just incredibly thankful for all of our participants um, who've been true collaborators in moving this forward. And I also just a tremendous thanks to my, uh, our full research group and, and, and team who do the heavy lifting for all these studies every day. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Charvet, for that great presentation overview of your, your program in this space. So we're going to go ahead and turn to the Q&A portion of our session. Um, so just as a reminder, um, please submit your questions to the Q&A pod directed to all panelists. Um, let's see, I haven't seen too many questions come in yet. So let me go ahead and just kick off the Q&A session while people sure. are still brainstorming their question. Um, so in general, it was really interesting, really innovative and I kind of have a two part question. So why do you think that fatigue is so sensitive to DTCS and perhaps it has to do with your um, region of interest, the DLPFC? Yeah. Um, but yeah, if you could speak a little bit more to why this technology is very, um, it appears to be pretty preliminarily effective for fatigue. And then secondly to that, I noticed you cited a paper where you're expanding this technology to um, patients with um, who've, who've contracted uh, or have COVID-19. And we, as we know, there's a big um, fatigue is a big um, symptom, you know, while you have yeah, COVID sure. and COVID long haulers. So if you can speak a little bit to that as well, um, that'd be really interesting. Yeah, so I've worked um, trying to understand and, and you know, advice for treatment with, with 
you know, patients with fatigue for many, many years, and it's such a troubling and frustrating symptom um, for people to live with. And I think part of the, there, there's, it's a really complex literature um, specific to MS. I, you know, it's, 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 uh, difficult to measure in terms of self-report because you get a lot of overlap. And so it, I think that that is part of the TDCS story that I mentioned is that um, especially depression. And again, I want to caution, you know, no way saying that depression is fatigue. I think that people sometimes hear that or, or are told that, and, and I don't think that's in any way true, but what you pick up on a self-report measure for depression, um, you know, for instance, you know, feeling flat or unable to complete things that you need to get done and that kind of thing or concentration difficulty. I think that there's an overlap in that way from the fatigue experience. And so if we try to separate out purely based on these end kind of messy self-report measures, um, it's hard to isolate what's fatigue and what that component of depression is. And I think also that we find that fatigue benefit because that shared component is responding when we know that it's effective for, for treatment of depression. Um, so again, I, in no way am I saying that fatigue and depression are the same, but I'm talking about at the self-report level, which is the way we have to define fatigue and depression for, for our trials at this moment in time, there's that shared component that um, may give us insight into the use of TDCS in that way. Um, so we may have inadvertently screened out, for instance, um, that component that may respond to TDCS for people with fatigue. Um, the 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 story of um, its use, especially for for long COVID, is, is really a rapidly developing story. And I I think you know because of the deployability of TDCS, and also that's another condition with an absence of any treatment options. So we're very eager to 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 uh, move forward and try to evaluate its use both you know really for all of the reasons that i i showed you um we have experience with people with long COVID, um with tdcs uh, um we published a, a, a few results from from two of our our patients um but again it's the fatigue as you mentioned i do think that there's a degree of uh we hear a lot about uh emotional dysregulation that i think again, is a, a potential use for TDCS. Um, and also that uh, boosting the cognitive, cognitive, you know, the fog that we hear people use, brain fog, and, and so just potentiating recovery. So I'm, I don't know that we're targeting anything specific to COVID itself, but the syndrome that follows um, I think TDCS can really help potentiate the recovery, especially if we can tailor it to the set of symptoms that the patient is experiencing. That's great, and it's it's it's, it's interesting these potential like common mechanistic pathways between conditions if if we're modulating those and getting an effect. Um, Johanna I had a question for you. Um, and she asks, of the non-MS related conditions and COVID that may be helped by the therapy, are there any others that you are particularly ripe or promising for future research? Outside of MS, so, so non-MS, is that, yeah. I believe that's what she's getting at, yeah. Yeah, so, so in our travels, um, especially because of the accessibility of our treatment, we have been truly overwhelmed with people from all over the world uh, wanting to at least have access to try TDCS uh, to see if it can help them in their condition. And, and I think, as you saw, TDCS has potential uses in, in, in many, many different applications. So um, we have people that we work with who have progressive motor conditions, ataxia, for instance, or uh, functional mobility problems due to different types of neurologic disorders. And so I think there's a very strong role there. Um, also, speech and language recovery for post-stroke aphasia, there's a really strong role there. So again, it's just almost anything you can think of if you can carefully do that, what we call the functional targeting of, of the region that's engaged with the training to boost or potentiate that benefit. Um, I, we're also very um, impressed by, by its use and benefit for depression. And, you know, again, it's all an optimization, but there's a large body of, of, of evidence there. Um, I think distress is a secondary kind of factor 
that people live with tends to exacerbate symptom burden. And I think if we can uh, extrapolate the tremendous benefit that we know it has for depression, again, it's getting at that components, but if we can help with that, I think that there might be a, a, a extended benefit for experience and burden of symptoms. Um, so there's a lot of, I guess I could go on and on, I think, <laughs> but there's a lot of really potential uh, areas of interest, and I think that that's why if we get back to the review, I showed you, it's just overwhelming what's in the category of, you know, level B probably effective or level C possibly effective because there's a lot of interesting signal and potential use that just needs that careful study to, to move it towards clinical implementation. Great. So there's a lot of questions coming and keep them coming. So I saw one pop in in the chat. So just if you don't mind, keep them to the Q&A box just so we can um, get to everybody's question. But Mika wants to know, she's curious to hear more about how you use the fMRI data for administering DCTS or DCS, excuse me. <laughs> did, did you use it to model stimulation patterns in individual brains, for example? So, it Briefly, no, we're looking basically at neuronal reactivity in response to the TDCS. So that's that's the primary focus is that um, can we understand how the brain responds to TDCS? Um, and, and is that response greater or does that mark benefit and or correspond or predict those people who have clinical benefit? So that's primarily what we're looking at. There's to that point, there's uh, to her question, is her question, there's a tremendous literature about um, imaging and, and TDCS, and I think soon we'll, we'll, there's just a lot of exciting work in this area, and, and that's an area that we really need that work to understand the mechanism, which I think then will inform back to our first question, really help us guide clinical use um, really specifically, because right now um, we're, we're doing a lot of behavioral targeting based on clinical findings. And I think that, you know, we need all of those findings, and especially from the neuroimaging world to help us guide and target and design our studies very selectively. All right, so I see a few more questions coming in. Um, let's see. Okay, so you kind of got into this in your previous slides, but uh, Glenn wants to know, has there been any negative side effects or worsening the frequency of MS attacks? Um, and anecdotally, what has your been experience of D, um, TTCS in Parkinson's patients? Yeah, so the first question, you know, um, we we entered into this world with a, a, what we call a tremendous abundance of caution. So we really watched for everything. And again, a true collaboration with our participants to help guide us and, and just really listen to what people are experiencing. And at this point, we, we've had such a high volume of, of participants and number of sessions and all. And so we have not seen worsening um, or any signal of that, um, nor are we aware of any you know, established theory that that would raise that caution. And so, but, you know, again, part of our protocol was just such a careful um, monitoring of, you know, status and safety and tolerability. So, again, we, we remain confident as, as again, with the full broad literature. And again, that's where we benefit from the hundreds of clinical trials done to date in TDCS that it that it is safe and tolerable for use. Um, Parkinson's disease, so so we did a study uh, with Parkinson's disease, and there's been some several other exciting Parkinson's studies um, looking both at cognitive, so, so very similar to the MS story, because again, looking at functional improvement, right? So both uh, uh, trials that have shown a boost of cognitive training, so cognitive benefit, and for improving motor functioning. Um, not at the level of, you know, definitely effective, but very nice positive signals. But then, I, you know, we have to have more research to really understand how to optimize that at an individual level and, and uh, move forward with actual treatment guidance. But I think that there's a very positive signal for its use, uh, particularly for cognitive and motor functioning in Parkinson's disease. Great. There's a lot of different uh, potential avenues that this technology can take. Right. So it's all, yes. 
Yeah. All right. So Ralph has um, has a technical question. He wants to know that given that given that TDC um, S has um, can have some local variability in current flow due to hair and scalp, mm -hmm. and that the current spread could affect both inhibitory as well as stimulatory fibers and even adjacent brain regions. Could you sharpen your results by teetering, uh, teetering or titering, excuse me, the TDCS for each patient to make sure that you're optimizing the therapeutic effect? So basically, how can you get it optimizing given the, the um, spread? Right, no, so that's a fantastic question. And I think that that's also a technology question. Um, that you know, I think that there's a lot of great work going on in there, and I think that's where the future will lead, right? Um, uh, in optimization and dosing and targeting. So we are, as you can see from our trials, we we used very fixed dosing because you know we wanted it to be controlled. So in that way, we were the direct opposite of of individualized dosing, which I think again ultimately is where we want to be. Um, we do know that the current field is very broad, so we're definitely reaching the target, but we are reaching adjacent regions too. And so we really used it as a fixed treatment to evaluate it, but but I, I completely agree with all of those factors that were raised as, as contributing to individual differences. And next steps will be to both use technology and study to optimize that benefit. At the level that we have, again, for the large clinical trials, it's so important to us to have fixed dosing in that way, the individual optimization wouldn't work for us. And we don't know enough about how to, and that's where we need the markers very badly on, you know, um, you know, optimizing at the individual level. Um, and yeah, so, um, you know, there's something called high definition or HD TDCS, which is, is really useful for targeting a more focal region. Uh, we don't use that here um, a lot. We didn't move to that because MS, the, the nature of MS disease, um, and uh, especially things like fatigue and cognitive functioning and to some degree motor dysfunction, we don't have a specific target that we're going for. So really we're looking for more compensatory benefit and that's the approach that we're taking versus targeting um, specific regions. The very, I mean, as I mentioned in the beginning, I was giving a really broad overview of what are really complicated and rapidly evolving topics, all of them. And so, um, yeah, that's a great question. Mark. I wonder if your concurrent use of fMRI might, you know, help um, a lot of this is what we're talking about too. Yeah, no, there's a lot of work um, using, you know, biomarker or imaging marker guidance to optimize. Mm -hmm. that, that's a yeah. Good, yeah. All right, so there's an earlier question that I, I missed. I apologize, Glenn. Um, but does uh, TDCS um, have any effect on plaque burden? So we were talking a little bit about um, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's. So have any effect on plaque burden? So I, I it's used, it's been used. There's trials, including a large home-based trial that's been completed. Um, it was open label in, in people with, with Alzheimer's disease and mild cognitive impairment. So there's definitely an evolving story um, with its use. Um, I don't, you know, and you have to forgive me, I'm not as close to that literature, but I don't believe that there's been any um, disease markers that have been evaluated in that context yet um, in terms of findings. I could, I, you know, but again, th that could be a limitation. Of, um, but I know that there's a lot of excitement and potential application there, an ongoing study that will will be able to answer those questions. I think a lot of the current studies underway using TDCS in those conditions um, and are including really nice neuroimaging outcomes as well, which will be really helpful. Great. Okay, there's so, um, a couple more questions, or actually maybe one or two left. Um, so uh, Elise, or um, Elise, I hope I'm saying your name right. So what is the biggest challenge to implementing um, this technology for widespread use at home? So really getting at that telehealth aspect of your work. Yeah, so um, it's, so TDCS devices in particular are overall in the, in the context of devices, they're low cost and they're wearable and they're portable. So, you know, I would consider it, you know, we, we call it deployable, highly deployable um, 
so I think the limitations, you know, there is some cost and I, you know, at the individual level, we definitely don't advise uh, a consumer based device. We don't know about the consumer based devices. We don't study them, but um, I, I think that clinical guidance um, is something that you need. So in the context of that, so you need clinicians who can guide you. Um, so that's a rate limiting factor currently, I think. Um, and also really important to have as many objective outcomes as you can to evaluate the potential benefit. Um, we use TDCS in the context of telehealth. Um, and so we, we were able to provide those things. Um, I, you know, so if you think about it as a service, by far the rate limiting factor is the approval status here in the United States. And so we're hopeful, you know, to move towards approval and, and for insurance coverage. And then I think that that would really allow for um, widespread access to treatment in the context of telehealth. Great. So a lot of a lot of exciting pathways in in this in this area of work. So this is great. I don't see any other uh, questions coming in, um, which is we're right on time, so that's perfect. Um, I did see that Valerie asked about um, your slides, so Dr. Charvet graciously agreed to share her slides, so you can reach out to to us directly at ODP, and we'd be happy to furnish those for you. Okay, so again, thank you so much, um, Dr. Charvet. Yeah, thank you um, very much for having me. It's been really a pleasure. To get, to get a chance yeah, and absolutely. And, and for all of you for attending, um, again, a recording of this webinar will be archived and shared at a later time. Um, uh, this was a fantastic session. Our next session will be in January, as you see here. Um, this will be on Wednesday, January 26th. Um, Dr. Jane Neuberger and Nan Trong will present the webinar entitled Update 2022 COVID-19 Multi-System um, Inflammatory Syndrome in Children and the Heart. So please be on the lookout for a flyer um, and reg registration link for this exciting webinar to be distributed soon. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and close out the session. If you have any questions about the Prevention SIG webinar series or today's presentation, please contact me, Jenny. And um, I wish you all a very happy, safe, and restful uh, holiday. Thank you.